for you. Oh, okay. Three, two, one, go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this very special episode. Uh, today, I've got someone who I've been following for a long time and whose journey has absolutely inspired me. She's someone who champions uh, the cause of mental health and putting yourself out there. She's got a massively impressive clothing line, which um, I think is is very interesting, very artistic. Thank you, Michelle, for doing this today and sparing the time for us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And I, I'm glad that we finally connected after all of this time. For everyone who's been living under a rock and doesn't know Michelle, Michelle uh, has an Instagram page called Schizophrenic NYC, which she's ventured out into this whole initiative where she's got an apparel line. Um, she's coming up with a lot of projects, which we'll talk about. But Michelle, get us to get us started. Talk about your talk to us about your mental health journey and what got you interested in the whole project. I mean, you want to start from when I was a child? Is that where we're starting at? Absolutely. We can, we've can. we got all the time in the world and we deep dive. So our audience is people who, uh, like I say, are geeks and interested in mental health. A lot of them are mental health professionals. So we can absolutely deep dive into the specifics of it. And we've got all the time in the world. Okay. Okay. So uh, I usually start this story off with like a, starting in high school, like, you know, ninth grade, things started changing a lot. And all through high school, you know, 14 through 18, like my mother kind of noticed this erratic behavior from me and she kept trying to get me help. But I had this voice in my head, which I didn't know was a voice in my head. I thought that everybody had this in their head. And so every day, everything I do, everything I was told by this voice in my head was basically telling me what a horrible person I was. So every time I went to try to go to sleep at night, the voice in my head would tell me, everything you did today was terrible. You said the dumbest things, you're the worst person everybody hates you just stop talking so I really became very withdrawn and not acting like my usual self my mother kind of noticed this erratic behavior she tried to get me help time and time again but I just kept fighting her because I really believed my mom was trying to hurt me sabotage me or want me dead I believe this wholeheartedly so I go to college because that's my way of getting free of my mom because I believed all these things about her. And I go to college and everything is totally fine for two months. I think I'm having the best time ever. I'm making like all these new friends. I'm taking these cool new classes that I really like. And then all of a sudden, I have those same thoughts, same exact voice, same everything. And I'm thinking that my roommate, my best friend, is trying to hurt me, sabotage me, and want me dead. And I'm like, what? This makes no sense. It like, why would I be say, having those same thoughts and everything about my mom in the past? Why would they be around my roommate? And then I realized my mom was right the whole, she was right the whole time. So that's when I first brought myself to the college health center for help. And well, in about 15 minutes, the guy told me that I was bipolar and said, you need to see the school psychiatrist. Like that lady was terrible. She didn't really ask me the right questions. She kind of just said, here's some pills, take these. Things didn't go so well. So for the, like, you know, the, my first year of college, freshman year, I ended up in the psych ward twice for like, you know, suicide attempts. And then once my sophomore year for suicidal tendencies. And uh, I finally found a doctor in, in that town, things I was I was upstate New York, where it's just like middle of nowhere, like a fun college town. But then you know everybody around there, it's like, why do you live here? They're just like people, like you know, it's just kind of like. So this new doctor was like, here, take this pill. And the thing is, this little pill, like I took it, and then all of a sudden, like everything in my head was calm, like all the like the fast repeating words, like the nonstop chatter, all of the paranoia, it was gone. I was like, Oh, my God, wow. Is this how people think? Like, is this normal life? And I was like, I'm gonna go take a nap. Because I hadn't taken a nap in years because I've never been able to I've been so jumpy all the time. And my thoughts never stopped. So I could never take a nap. So it's like, I was like, I'm gonna take a nap. Like, Wow. So that went uh, went well for a while. The thing is I had to take it three times a day and it just like sometimes if I dropped off, I'd get angry. But what helped me is that I was on the lacrosse team and I had my coach there that was very like she we had a conversation one time and she was like, listen, if you're going to play, you have to take your medicine because every time you don't take your medicine, somehow it falls on me in some way, like in, on her in some way, some sometimes. So she was like, take your medicine or I don't want you to play. But we kind of had to keep that between us in some sense. So I graduated college. I no longer saw that doctor. I didn't have that medication. And I was living in New York. Well, I was living outside of New York City 
commuting to New York City for like internships and stuff and things weren't going well because I'd be trying to do work and like I couldn't sit behind a desk all those days and I'd be seeing things, I'd be hearing things and like I was not good at being an intern because if you're full of anxiety and you're supposed to be doing artwork, you think your artwork is terrible and you can't do anything. So I said I, to my mom, I, was like, I need to speak to a doctor. I need to speak to a new doctor. And I spoke to some psych some therapist. And I remember I thought she was so old. This is ridiculous. This lady is so old. Because, you know, when my, she was like, I found you a woman with decades of experience. She has so much experience. And I was 22. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a woman with decades of experience, very experienced, but also really, really old. That's decades of experience, isn't that? So I was 22 and this lady was like 70 years old. Like, and I understand, I'm not trying to insult old people, but sometimes you have to match, you know, the person with the therapist. And what my mother was just looking at was the experience, not really looking at why would I want to talk to a 70 year old lady when I'm 22 years old? Like, it just doesn't go. I mean, some people find that's fine, but doesn't my, I think my mother knows me. Like, why would I want to talk to an old lady older than my mom? It was just, it doesn't go. And I know that makes me sound kind of weird and like, kind of like, like I like ageism, but like, it, that's really the, the truth. Like, if you're going to find a therapist, find one you're going to want to talk to, you know? Hmm. That's just how I felt. But from talking to that lady and like she was just uh, I didn't and like anything about her, not just because she was old. It was also because the things she said was just so stupid. But like I I started seeing the psychiatrist she recommended me to. And he was like, I'm from New York. This guy was so New York. And he was basically like, you're going to answer my questions. Don't say you're not going to answer them. You paid a lot of money to be here and you're going to answer them. And I was like, I like this guy. He's not like, you know, let, he's actually like holding me responsible, like holding me accountable. Like, this is the guy that I like, like somebody who's actually going to banter back and forth with me and tell me what's up. So I saw him a few times. And then I was like, listen, like I, it's like I can't do anything because I keep seeing things. Like, there's people. I can see the people like you're here. But over here, I see a room full of people. And eventually he was like, OK, I think you have schizophrenia. And I was like, really upset. But I didn't know how to handle it, but I was upset, but I was, but whatever, I, like, I think I was waiting for that diagnosis without actually wanting that diagnosis because, like, two weeks after I found out, I went out with my best friends from college. We were at, like, McFadden's on 42nd and 2nd. Check it out. And I was like, guys, I found that I have schizophrenia. And seriously, their reaction was, isn't that what you had the whole time? That could have not been more obvious. And yeah, we told you that. And I was like, all right, you guys already knew. They're like, they're like, that was the most obvious thing about you. Like, we really thought you already had that. And I was like, okay. So it kind of like taught me like, if my best friends already knew and didn't care at all, why should I care about like, you know, negative interactions I have with people that I don't care about? That kind of really helped me there. Cause it was kind of like, this is stupid. My friends don't mm -hmm. care. Why do I care if other people would care? That's their problem, not my problem. That's just kind of what was going yeah. through my head, really, honestly. Yeah. And then so I was, I, you know, I studied graphic and web design and some, some web development. And I was working at, you know, it's New York City. There's a bazillion jobs. So you just have to apply to a bazillion and you get whatever job. But I had so many jobs and I kept getting laid off at all of them just because of like all of my symptoms. I just, it was just not working. Like I just couldn't do it. Also, you know, college doesn't teach you that you will be sitting behind a desk for eight hours a day. You know, they teach you, oh, this is work. This is what you do, you know, because the professors, they're chilling. They're having a great time. You know, professors have the best job ever. I know it takes a lot to get a PhD, but like they don't teach you like, yeah, you're going to be doing this work behind a desk for eight hours, not wearing sweatpants and you don't get to take a nap. You know, they, they don't teach you that. So working with that doctor, we tried, there was like, first we went on this med, then we added this, then we added this, then we added this, then we added this, all based on things that I was talking to him about, things like that. And so I got better that way, but also, so since I kept losing all those jobs, I was like, listen, I need to work for myself. I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do. And I was like, you know what? Let's go big and bold. Because like I said before, I really didn't care if anyone else found that I had schizophrenia because I thought it was stupid because my best friends didn't care. I was like, I'm just going to start this brand, Schizophrenic NYC. It's going to be like clothing and stuff. But I had no idea what I was doing. And I ordered a bunch of shirts. I spent $500. And my mother emailed my doctor and said, what is this crazy idea she's doing? Like, she just spent $500 on shirts. And my doctor's telling me this. And I'm like, listen, 
I have a plan. I didn't have a plan. But <laughs> so I just I just like signed up at a flea market, lost a lot of money, but um, eventually things got better. I met somebody at a market and she ended up becoming my roommate and she had a lot of experience in doing markets and stuff like that. She had been selling jewelry, vintage jewelry for over 12 years at that point. So she became a roommate of mine and she saw some artwork on my wall and was like, what is this artwork? And I was like, oh, that's mine. She goes, this is your artwork. You need to start selling it. And it was unbelievable because once I started selling my artwork, people started buying my artwork. Cause I brought, I was like, let's see, I'll bring this today to the market. We'll see if it even sells. It sold. I was like, what? And it, like, it's really one thing for an artist to create art, but for people to actually buy your artwork, it's like other people like my artwork so much they bought it. That's absolutely the craziest thing ever. Oh my God. So that's amazing. So working with the, that girl, like, like we just worked together on certain things. She told me packaging, she told me all like the little things in a business that you just need to run to make people just like your business more. Just all these little tidbit things of markets that people just have to learn. She gave me like a crash course because she has so much experience and things expanded and I have more shirts now. Now I'm printing my own shirts. Now I'm doing more things, things expand. And you know what? Who knows? I ended up in a WebMD documentary. That's what really catapulted a lot of stuff. And then Mashable Magazine covered me and that catapulted a lot of stuff. And then I don't even know. I don't even know. Somehow it got to be to this, what it is. And that, I, I don't know. I think I answered your question. I think, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's a beautiful start to the conversation, I think. Um, <laughs> to get us started, like I said, we've got massive geeks who uh, mm -hmm. work in mental health. Um, let's talk a little bit about your childhood, as much as you're comfortable, of course. Uh, tell us what was life. Did, are you a New York girl all throughout? Um, well, I'm from just above New York City, not far away from all. So I've been to the city like my whole life. And then when I went to college, <laughs> I went to upstate New York. But because my plan was always <laughs> leave the area. And then because I also wanted to play college sports. And if you're in the city, it's 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 like D1 or whatever. I can only play D3, which is still good. It's still good, I'd say. Right. All right. Yeah. But um, then I wanted to come back and then eventually live in New York City. I just had to get a job to be able to have money to live in New York City. So it's like... Yeah, you know, how to get out mm. of that intern phase. But yeah. my goal was always to live in New York City. And now I do, yeah. and I have been for a while. Mm. And what was childhood like? Did you grow up in a well-to-do neighborhood or what What was it like? Um, well, um, I, yeah, I grew up in Westchester, which everyone knows as like a bougie Westchester. You know, if you watch Friends, I saw you had that Central Perk cup you were drinking out of. So like on the last episode of Friends, Ross and Rachel said they're moving to Scarsdale. That's in mm. Westchester. And that's very close to where I'm from. But you can tell the difference from when you go from where I'm from to Scarsdale because the road gets paved. Like mm. that's how nice Scarsdale is. You, that's mm. how you can always tell. That's like, now we're in Scarsdale. The roads paved nicely, right? right. So, so um, like, also for my, I graduated with Ray Rice. He was a professional football player for a while. Like, like we had a big football team. Like, but where where I grew up, like, like it's very different classes of of people and stuff like that. So, like, my, my high school was very diverse. The neighborhood mm. I grew up in was very Jewish. So, like, on, like, Shabbat, there's always people walking all over the place going to temple and everything like that but uh, like it, it's it's everything you can imagine ever 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 mm. you can walk out of a mansion where i'm from you walk five minutes down the street and you can get robbed mm. so it's a very so interesting it a area <laughs> it's an interesting place it's an interesting place yeah. and what was family like did you have siblings growing up who lived with you parents yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I have an older brother, and I grew up with my both my parents, and we hung out with my uh, dad's sister and her family a lot. So, like, my cousins with them, they were, like, basically siblings. We always hung out all the time. And, mm. I mean, we got in fights sometimes, as kids do, but, like, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all cool now. They all kind of moved mm. away. I'm the only one that's really around, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only yeah. one that's stuck, stuck around, so they see me when they're here. Yeah, but and then you good. said that the f first time you started noticing things was when you were in ninth grade. That makes makes you roughly fourteen years old. Yes. Talk to us about what was life before the time. Of course, there wouldn't be like a start date when you start noticing those things. But how was life, or how was as a nine year old? How did you process the the idea that you 
heard things or saw things which children around you couldn't and right now it 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 probably makes a bit more sense with the diagnosis and the support and the medications and everything but as a 9 9th standard student as, as a 14 year old there's a lot happening already with a 14 year old and then on top of that all these things come what was that michelle thinking at that time I mean, I didn't know that that people didn't also have this voice in their head. I thought everybody had it, something in their head critiquing them all the time. I had no idea that it was just me, and I was so paranoid that everybody hated me because that's what the voice was telling me. So I believed it. And I think I almost made a self-fulfilling prophecy that I made people not like me by the things that I would say or the things that I would do or anything. I don't I didn't know how to act because everything I did, I was being told was really dumb. So I I mean I had no idea how to act or anything and then I'd be taking classes I had a teacher that was convinced I had a cell phone but I didn't because I was I guess talking to myself during class and I didn't know things like that um like I was it was just like you know it was just like you hit you, you just it was just rough cuz I didn't I wasn't good at school anymore because I would be taking tests swearing that the teacher had said these answers and said these things but then I was wrong because I was just making up things that I believed the teacher had said but she had not ever said those things so mm-hmm. school was getting harder friends were getting harder it was all getting harder and all I just did was hate myself mm-hmm. yeah yeah and did you find solace in someone was there someone who growing up at that age you found very comfortable to be with or be around i mean sometimes i guess i had some friends that were better as i got a little bit older i made better friends i always had mm-hmm. to just have like a close knit type of friends because i always got too afraid around a lot of people that a lot of, like that somebody over there is talking about me but that you know they weren't but I, if you're in a big group you just like oh she looked at me that means they're talking about me you know things like that so like just having a close group of people was like m- much easier for me to deal with and of course like right now because of the amount of mental health advocates with that we've got going around and people talking about mental health people don't feel as much stigmatized approaching a psychiatrist or a therapist what was your first journey you said you started noticing things from the age of 14 what age did you go to a therapist or a psychiatrist for the first time in your life possibly ninth grade but i i didn't comply with anyone i didn't want to talk to them because i also thought that they were going to like you know tell my mother things and my mother to me was my like worst enemy you know at mm. that time because i you know how people get so funny as so many times turn the closest people against them and believe they're hurting them so i just didn't talk to any of these people i didn't want to and when was the first time you thought that you know what i'm going to accept the help that that's out there and and sort of take meds or take therapy not until i got to college and realized it Co- for myself hmm. that's a really unusual thing like in most cases most times people who have a mental health disorder in the form of say schizophrenia or bipolar they don't usually are able to gather that motivation to come and start taking medications etc what got you to say that you know what i'm i'm going to start complying was it that psychiatrist who you said was a straight shooter was completely honest with you and that that's what got you engaged in the conversation Well, I mean also the doctor in college like I was really struggling and I needed to I needed something. I knew I needed a medication because I was like I'm so anxious. I can't stop moving around. I'm upset, I'm sad. And then he just gave me that medication and that's all I needed him for. I didn't talk to him about my life. And then it was one of those things where he always asked me the same questions like about the lacrosse team. How many people are on a field? Do you have a regular goalie? Do they wear pads? How long are the halves? How long is this? And then I realized I was like, why is he always asking me the same questions? And then I realized he's asking me the same questions cuz he's measuring my mood. I was like, duh. Right? That's why he's doing that. So I needed that medication then. So that's why I dealt with him, but I didn't really start talking to anyone until the doctor who was the straight shooter and then I talked to him more. Mm. Yeah. There there's a lot of stigma around like people do talk about going to the therapist but you're someone who I've noticed constantly advocates the use of medications and stands by it and the fact that they've really helped you get through a really difficult phase in fact yeah. you've got a line of um, 
medication boxes as well, pill boxes as well as a part of your yes. uh, whole initiative. Talk yes. to us a little bit about the role that medications have played because I think that is a very, very, as a psychiatrist, I'm very easily able to convince people to take therapy, but then taking medications and the fact that medications do help, they're scientific, they're as much scientific as a diabetes medication is for diabetes. Um, and the idea that you need medications, you're not addicted to it. Just like you wouldn't say that you're addicted to your hypertension medication, just like you wouldn't say that you're addicted to your diabetes medication. You shouldn't say that you're addicted to the medication that yeah, you're taking I, for say schizophrenia or bipolar trust. or depression. Talk to us a little bit about your journey with medications and how that has sort of worked so far. Okay, you just kind of you just kind of froze a little bit. You you froze when you said diabetes medication. Okay, the the question, uh, my question was that um, talk to us a little bit about your journey with medications and did you have some sort of a stick? Not I don't want to use the word stigma, but did you have some sort of uh, apprehension? when you took medications with with the common misconceptions or stigmas that people have um the thing is i i i knew that i needed medication and so i tried medications at first like when i was like first 18 years old from the health center from that psychiatrist that the college recommended and things went so terribly bad that um like because because i didn't know anything at that time and they didn't tell me that like you know these medications can make you feel more depressed i didn't know that so when i went back in there and she's like well how do you feel i was like i guess i feel good because you know me in my life i never knew what real happiness felt like i was just going by the monitor of all of my friends because they all said like i was acting all out of control but I took these pills and I was much more quiet, more subdued. I wasn't happy. I was just kind of just like, whatever, whatever. And they were like, oh, well, I was thinking I was doing better because I wasn't running around all over the place talking to everyone. So I said they were doing better. I was doing better on them, but um, I wasn't, you know? And I never really told her that until I had to go to the psych ward and then I never saw her ever again and I'm pretty sure the whole big blow up there the whole big thing the whole big scene everything with that got her fired because I kept explaining I had no idea that this medication could make me feel worse because I was doing what she told me to do and I didn't feel better I had no idea so that for a little while made me want not want to take any medication until I realized like I can't live life like this I can't live life feeling this way there has to be be some way that I could feel better I don't like this you know what I'm saying like I don't I didn't like the feelings that my body was just do I felt anxious like I was gonna run around all over the place I couldn't concentrate so every medication that I took or take and everything that I do is just to make me feel better and I know people say they don't want to take medication but do you want to feel better are you not liking how you you're feeling now you know I don't think medications are bad for you I think they're only trying to improve your life. And anyone with a stigma against it is thinking, oh, they want, want to be like, like that person over there who's so sick. Like, you know, who's sick? Who are you comparing yourself to? You know, especially, you know, you might think of, they're, maybe they're thinking of, oh, medications in the past, in the 50s, they put, they doped everybody up and everybody was so messed up, everything. Like, medications now are so, are, are so much better and like, like sometimes like, you have to take a medication to, 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 for like the side effects of your other medication and that's okay. It's not that bad. It's fine, right? It's, there's nothing yeah. wrong with it. But like I was kind of for a while, I didn't want to take medication until I realized I like life better when I'm on it than when I'm mm. not on it. So that's where I thought it was a good idea. Mm. You know, I when I realized- that's a beautiful word. Yeah, sorry, please go on. No, no, I was just, I was like, I just realized that, like, you know, life is better on medication than it is off medication. And, and I wanted to have a better mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's one of the ma major things that got me to ask you to do this was the idea, the way that you address the stigma around medications as well. I've practiced in a couple of countries. I've practiced in India and now in the UK. Talk, walk us through the mental health system in the US. I know that a lot of things work different from state to state as well. And a lot of it is insurance based. Um, 
I've worked in private in India as well, and I've worked in government hospitals in in India, and then you know, um, in the in the UK as well. But walk us through what what uh, the mental health care system in the US is like, and what are the things that would be your reflections or places where they could potentially improve. Well, the mental health system is very interesting in the United States. I don't know every single thing about it, but it's not the easiest thing to deal with because a lot of like jobs. Um, their mental health like package you get 10 visits a year to a therapist like who who is that going to help you know what i'm saying so i think that a lot of workers a lot of jobs need to change that you need to like also include like actual real help for therapy like 10 visits a year is not enough so just a sec so no matter how good you are or how bad you are you get a fixed 10 10 therapy sessions a year well it, it depends where you work but most mm. places, if they even do offer mental health support, will give you ten mm. visits a year. Mm. If they even if they even offer if they, it, yeah. that's what you'll get, right. and that's not going to help anyone, right? And then, okay, so the medications can be so expensive. I have a special like a uh, card for it, but if I didn't, one of my medications is about five dollars. My friend, she does not have the same insurance as me, she pays about $450 for the same exact medication that I take because we're on different insurance Whoa. plans. Mm -hmm. And that's $450 for a week supply, a month supply? For a month. For a month. For a month. Yeah. So my, I, my, my insurance is very good and I don't have to pay that much money for my medications. But if I was not on my insurance, it'd be about $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So that's and are something... we talking completely separate costs for seeing the psychiatrist and seeing the therapist besides oh, yeah, the medications yeah, yeah, yeah. as well? Yeah. So also like some psychiatrist like my own doesn't even take insurance. He doesn't even take insurance. Mm. Otherwise, if you have like some people, a lot of people with mental health issues, they're not working at very good jobs or very high paying jobs or jobs that have great insurance because there are a lot of their mental health issues get in the way of that. So they have to get other insurance, which is very bad insurance. So they can only try to find therapists that'll take that insurance. And the therapists are usually not the best if they're taking mm. that insurance or they don't have any real good experience at all i know i said before decades of experience but like uh, half like like i had a friend with an eating disorder and she talked to a girl who was obviously very new and she was like oh you have an eating disorder oh yeah i have a friend she's just so skinny and she just keeps eating and she doesn't gain any weight would you say that to a girl <laughs> with an eating disorder she was like, oh my God, what? She said she, my friend was on the computer zooming and she said she just closed the computer and was done. She just mm. shut it off. Like you don't say that to a person with an eating disorder. You don't talk about your friend that can't, that can't gain weight no matter what. Like that's yeah. a person that will take a Medicaid. You know what I mean? Medicaid. Yeah. So, yo, we don't have that free healthcare in America, but we have that Medicaid, which is free healthcare only if you make below a certain amount of money, but then you have to find the people that take the Medicaid. That's the people that take the Medicaid. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Because it's the Medicaid from what I've been told is like, if you take a patient that has like a very good health insurance, you fill out a little form and say you make a hundred dollars. If you take Medicaid, you fill out a stack of forms and then maybe you make 20 bucks. Why do people mm. want to take Medicaid? You don't want to take Medicaid. So you're stuck with this crap. You know, mm. you're only taking Medicaid if you, if you don't, if you're not getting a lot of clients or you're very new. That's what I'm saying. Mm. So our free right. health care for the poor, poor, poor people who make under enough is not very, very good. So you're kind of stuck in a, you're, you're stuck. You're, you have a bad mental health. You can't get a good doctor, things like that. It, it doesn't work very well that way. Mm. And of course, Do you then all, also, like, if you make above that amount of money, but you don't make a lot of money, then you're stuck somehow paying for this doctor with your you're above Medicaid, but you're below certain and you, how are you paying for your doctor and your medications when your health insurance isn't good enough? Hmm. Things like that. And things there's like right. disability and everything with a disability if you're disabled. But then if you get married and your partner makes a, above a certain money, you can lose all of your disability, all of your health insurance. It's just, you're kind of, it's the disability trap. It's like just the disability trap. Hmm. Do you have like government run and government owned hospitals 
or set up? So is it all privately owned and then you buy that insurance and just they, they just sort of outsource it or uh, contract uh, a private hospital to provide that service? I, uh, no, I, I, I don't know exactly about every hospital. I don't know about, I'm not sure about if they're, uh, government funded or, or not, but, um, I think, I think they pretty much take all insurance, but the thing mm. is there's always a copay, you know what I mean? It's like, how much do you owe on this bill based on the insurance right. that you have? Right. Yeah. I Sometimes see. you have and to what surpass the number. Yeah. What was it? Mm. Right. Right. Uh, what were psych wards like growing up when, when you told us that you had oh, been admitted were, a couple of times? Oh, they were awful. They were so awful. I, I've had friends that said they've gone to good ones and they had a great time. I went to terrible ones. They were, they were so boring. They were so awful. One place, they wouldn't let us watch TV during the day because they didn't want us just sitting there watching TV. Okay, what are we doing instead? Sitting in my room? Um, what do mm. you want me to do? Color? One place they wouldn't let us go outside. They said, we used to let people go outside, but one guy ruined it. I go, well, can I just go outside? No, we can't just take you outside. So you're just locked inside? Yeah. But the other place that let us go outside, we went outside the door. We stood on the steps. And I said, so what are we doing? And she goes, you guys can, uh, they're like, here's a ball. I go, okay. So I threw a ball to a guy and he couldn't catch it. I said, so we can stand on these stairs and throw a ball to each other? And she's like, yeah, that's what you guys can do. I was like, oh, that's great. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. This is not helpful. Not helpful. And then, are there good words as well? Like words, like you said, your friends. I mean, I've I've heard I, I've heard stories from people where they had great times. Like they learned they they were very fulfilling. They they learned about themselves. They got on the right meds. They had great group therapy. I was like, where were these places? Because that's not <laughs> anywhere I went. Hmm. You know, and sometimes the nurses just so obviously don't want to be there. You know, mm. it's like they don't even like their job and we're just stuck here. Yeah. Ugh. I, I do think that mental health is one of those fields where when undergraduate students or MBBS uh, doctors, undergraduate doctors ask me that, should I take mental health? I say that it's it's a field which you only want to take if you're very, very passionate about it. Because if you're sitting with the idea that I want to practice as many patients or I want to see as many patients as I can, practice of quantity is probably not the field as far as mental health is concerned. You are going to be spending hours and hours with your patients. It is going to bring out a lot of trauma that you've gone through when you talk to them. And sometimes it the discussions do get heated. One of the main reasons why I got into mental health is, is the fact that it's so subjective. I grew up in a small town in India. Then I practiced in a city city. I lived in a small beach town in the UK for a while. Now I'm in London. And the thing that absolutely astonishes me is for a diagnosis of say schizophrenia the the delusions the hallucinations the content of those voices are very different and very individual to the place where you're born and brought up your childhood because at the end of the day it's your brain which is creating these voices that it, it, they're not coming from anywhere else it's only our brain our upbringing our culture which is influencing these voices whereas and that's what makes it interesting that's what makes it very individualistic the whole idea of mental health what sort of stigma did, did you face growing up or through the whole journey of your struggles with mental health? And how did you sort of have the resilience to say, as an entrepreneur, you, you're you starting something which is completely new, uh, mental health apparel and um, was, I don't think, is, is still being done to the level that you're doing and as well as you're doing. So when you pitch this idea to investors, when you pitch this idea to factories that, you know, this is what you're going to do, do you sometimes face some sort of stigma? I mean, no, no, not, not really. They're kind of like, I mean, I don't think so, but, um, it kind of just is what it is. I started off doing something that nobody else was doing and it, it, people like I pop up on the streets of New York city and they just start talking to me. People love to talk to me about like that because as soon as I say like, you know, I have a mental illness, I have schizophrenia, people are always like, you know, I, they're either, they have a mental illness, a friend does or a family member does. So I just connect with so many people and I just talk to so many people on the streets and people like, like what, once I say I have schizophrenia, I just, people will just, just, just tell me their life story. And I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And everyone's got something to say. Because one in five New Yorkers has a mental health issue, but they don't talk about it because of all the stigma. So I think people can really relate. I've gotten some very strange looks. 
I've gotten people who have been mad at me. They think I'm making fun of people. But it's like, it it, it kind of just is what it is when it comes across. Like a Scientologist once came up and was like, I don't believe in medicine. I was like, you can keep walking. Just go. Keep walking. Bye. Bye. You know, you don't have to say anything. You know, you know, you know, nothing nice to say. Don't see anything at all. Bye. See you later. I don't need you here. Bye. Yeah. You know. It, I, I actually mean, visited a Scientology church once and um, got through the whole assessment that they do as well. Could could be a <laughs> completely different conversation. But talk to us a little bit about, besides apparel, besides the clothing line, you do a lot of work around mental health. You've got a podcast as well. Tell us about all the interesting work that you're doing besides the clothing line. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, I have a podcast, a bipolar a schizophrenic and a podcast. It's written with my friend Gabe Howard. He's bipolar. And we just... Um, have this podcast you can find it at bsp.show or on your favorite podcast player and it's him the bipolar me the schizophrenic and together we have a podcast and it's just like we find a topic and then we just banter about it and people find it funny because we're just the most ridiculous people and that's what we're doing and then i also i work with different like uh pharmaceutical companies and we create content together we have some stuff coming up and to be coming out on my uh, social media you'll see that soon and oh god what am i doing coming up i i don't know i don't even know what i have doing coming up we'll see i never know what the future is bringing until like a week before it happens fabulous yeah. well thank you so much michelle for your time today i think it's been a fascinating conversation and i look forward to seeing you again to talk further about your journey i'm yeah. sure you'll do very interesting stuff yeah definitely thank you for having me thank you <laughs>